I have no historical pun for you today because the world seems to be ending and it feels like a perfect joke on humanity and its history in itself. Hi, welcome to Russian History of Russia in quarantine. My name is Asya. In today's episode, me trying to act like everything's totally fine, Ivan III or the Great of Russia gathering all the northeastern loose lands and all the bonus points and totally winning at the monarchy game, the official end of the so-called Tatar-Mongo yoke on Russia, the fall of the Novgorod Republic and more. And that's why it's so fun to study history of Russia. The end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century is the time when linguistic, cultural and religious unity of the former Rus lands finally becomes a political unity as well. This is when the Grand Prince of Moscow becomes a Tsar. Moscovia pretty much becomes Russia and even the double-headed eagle is adopted as a symbol of Russian monarchy. It is also when the socio-economic classes like serving nobles that would exist pretty much till the end of the 19th century century are formed. Ivan's new state got recognition in Europe and Caucasus and also formed the foundation that will be used in the 16th century for its expansion east. And Ivan III not only defined political life and direction of the soon-to-be Russian Tsardom in the later half of the 15th century, he pretty much created it. So Ivan was born and brought up to be a ruler. He was involved in politics as early as eight years old. And and his childhood was pretty much defined by the Moscovite civil war, which his father Vasily eventually won, sacrificing his eyeballs in the process. Ivan himself escaped the fate of becoming a child hostage and a victim of this power struggle several times, and even successfully led battles with his father's generals as a very young prince. All of that is to say that Ivan had a very good practical education on what the world and the power he was born into are really like, and picked up a lot of early knowledge on political and military strategies along the way. He also had a very early start in governing. Although not formally a ruler with his father's disability, his role in the state affairs was very prominent from his teenage years. So in addition to occupying the throne from 1462 to his death in 1505, he was kind of a deputy ruler from mid-50s, so he could rightfully put half a century of experience on his CV. That CV also included him being consistent, determined and smart, just like any fresh out of college job applicant, only in case of Ivan, chances of him landing the job were like real. On the Moscow throne, he applied flexible and cunning strategies and tactics to achieve his number one goal, which was gathering as many Russian-speaking Orthodox territories under his firm wing as possible. These scenarios included a good old head-on military takeover, a slow, peaceful conversion through political dependency, and step-by-step -step acquisition of lands through local aristocracy and landowners. At the beginning of Ivan's rule, at least seven major Rus principalities remained semi-independent, although acknowledging Moscow's leadership as so-called Big Brother. And about five more were conquered by Lithuania. Rostov and Yaroslavl principalities were added to Ivan's estate in the early 70s. Large parts were already his through his family's previous marriages, loans and acquisitions, and the leftovers were easy to buy up. Local dukes proclaimed their servitude to Ivan to keep at least some of their family lands, and became some of the early members of the newly forming social class of Russian nobility or gentry. Large landowners and sworn servitude to the Tsar known in Russian as Pameshike. This process that eventually happened in pretty much all of his lands guaranteed Ivan one of, if not the most important thing in politics, a strong, stable, populous army. He didn't need to negotiate with princes anymore, not knowing if they would support him against the enemy or not. He knew that they will because they had no choice. Speaking of armies, 
Tver, Vatka and Novgorod fought for their autonomy and lost. Novgorod was a snack. Its lands were vast and rich, especially with furs, the biggest if not the only moneymaker in the region. With the central parts of Russia overhunted, North was the only place still abundant with it. That nice income is in fact the reason that Novgorod's political system really mutated over the centuries. From the aristocratic republic, where even the lower classes felt like they had some voice through Novgorod Veche and were proud of their freedoms into an oligarchy. The wealth and and the power of about 20 oldest aristocratic families, the Bayars, grew so large that they alone had all the decision-making power, including the power to keep making themselves even wealthier. Sorry if that sounds any familiar. Their self-preservation strategy put them in a tough spot between Moscow and Lithuania, both powers clearly glancing towards the Republic. As the pressure from Moscow grew, the Bayars of Novgorod began leaning towards an allegiance with Lithuania. The last straw was Novgorod Archbishop plotting against Ivan's autocracy, complemented with a 1471 visit paid by a Lithuanian duke. According to the latest peace treaty from the last war, Novgorod was not allowed to engage in any foreign affairs without a permission from the Grand Prince. So Moscow responded with a war. These were pretty trumped up charges, but this was long time coming one way or another. A hot summer had dried up the swamps, allowing Ivan's forces an unobstructed access deep into Novgorod lands, where they effortlessly defeated the Novgorodian army. Several bayars were decapitated and the attitude was generally pretty violent, not something that had occurred before in the previous conflicts. However, at the time, Novgorod bent the knee to Ivan III, but its crippled independence remained. Over the course of the next seven years, the aristocracy remained divided, many advocating for an allegiance with Lithuania and Poland and even the Horde. Counting on their military help, the pro-Lithuanian faction eventually caused riots against the Moscow supporters. In a response, Ivan besieged the city and the help they counted on never arrived. In January of 1478, Novgorod fell. Ivan spent a month in the city, dismantling its institutions and cleansing the aristocratic class of any disloyal elements. The symbol of the Novgorodian Republic, the Veche Bell, was taken down and moved to Moscow, and the new borders of Ivan's domain stretched from the Baltic Sea to the Ural Mountains. The Principality of Tver was now now a problem for Ivan, because while being surrounded, it peers deep into his territory, and that could be used by Lithuanians to their advantage in case of a conflict. The Prince of Tver was actually on his best behavior and enthusiastically assisted Ivan in his military operations. But upon learning of the rumored plans for Tver, he did exactly what Ivan feared the most, reached out to Lithuanian Polish king for help. Ivan, of course, responded with a dramatic treason and went to war with him in 1485. This one went down much smoother than Novgorod, though. Tveit Prince ran from Ivan's united army into Lithuania, even leaving the treasury behind, and the nobles opened the city gates. They too swore servitude to Ivan and got to keep the ownership of their lands. Two examples of Moscow's long game are Pskov and Rezain. The reason nobody rushed to claim Rezain, although it was heavily influenced by Moscow and a relatively easy grab was its location and the role of the Southern Guard. Incorporating it would have meant a big addition to Muscovian southern border, which would have required a lot of military protection from all the raids. For that reason, it would only be fully incorporated by Ivan's son, Vasily III, who was left no choice in 1521 by the resigned prince, who was getting way too cozy with the Crimean Khan. Pskov is one of the few principalities I didn't really mention in the earlier episodes, and the reason for that is that Pskov was kind of a Novgorod satellite and essentially resembled a miniature poorer version of it. Its policies were previously aligned with Novgorod, but in 15th century it became more friendly with Moscow in hopes that it would help them remain independent from the overbearing northern brother. That's cute. 
Moscow took advantage of Pskov's military, using them against Sweden and Novgorod, and sent its representatives to assist with the governing, who were really just robbing them. But Ivan III didn't push Pskov to the end because of this extremely vital and fragile Baltic trade that was bringing metals and weapons into Russian lands and in which Pskov played the key role, so Ivan preferred not to risk destabilizing that. The slow agony of Pskov Republic independence lasted all the way to 1510, when again Ivan's son Vasily III was the one to fully include them in his domain and kick out the ruling aristocracy from the city. Finally, Ivan's rapidly souring relationship with Lithuanian-Polish king Casimir IV led to yet another awkward war in the 80s. Ivan didn't manage to get a hold of any significant or whole lands, but he did push out the border and added a dozen major towns to his portfolio. Am I forgetting anyone? Oh yeah, the Horde. No wonder, because that ending was rather anticlimactic. The official ending of the so-called Tatar-Mongol yoke is the 1480 Grand Stand on the Yugra River, which wasn't even the first stand on the Yugra River. One had already happened before with Lithuania in 1402. I guess there's something really demotivating about that particular river. Anyhow, Moscow was pretty inconsistent with its payments to the Horde ever since the Battle on the Don River in 1380, and Ivan again stopped all payments in the 1470s. Khan Ahmad, in response, attempted the usual move, a military raid. He performed a number of rather weird maneuvers on the southern border, eventually crossing into Lithuanian territory and stopping at the Yugra River on the border with Moscow. There, the armies on the both sides stood for several months, and with the winter approaching, Ahmad turned around and left. Why is the matter of guesswork, but the most reasonable explanation I've come across is that Ahmad was counting on King Casimir to join him, and when that never happened, he withdrew. He seems to have had plans to come for a visit later, but upon his return was attacked by another one of Golden Horde's offsprings, and at that point the whole thing became its own mess and wasn't really on Ivan's top priorities list ever again. With the exception for the Crimean Khanate, which he actually had a pretty productive alliance with, and Kazan Khanate, which was located way too close to be ignored. Ivan ended up defeating them and imposing the same exact system that used to strangle Rus for centuries, the tributary vassalage. This is actually quite important in the context of the upcoming bonus episode on the history of Siberian exploration and conquest. In the 16th century, after a brief period of independence, Kazan will essentially become a base of operations operations for those eastbound waves of Russian explorers and colonizers. In addition to those of his already mentioned CV qualities, Ivan inherited those that had pretty much built Moscow in the first place. He was careful, pragmatic, and really good with money. Like his predecessors, he wasn't into wasteful lavishness. His court had strict conduct and spending policies. Instead, he invested in building up his city to rival the great capitals of the time, and increasing and securing his autocratic power. He also had the It's the Economy Stupid poster on his office wall. But seriously, Ivan did all the right things when it came to his state's finances. He initiated universal property records, reformed the tax system, and enforced its unified application among his many newly acquired territories. He also enforced the use of one single currency and fought the monasteries grip on trade and their tax privileges. Actually, by the end of the century, he had a pretty big conflict with the Orthodox Russian Church. And there was a conflict within the Church, where the scales of faith and doctrines of humble living and the massive wealth that the Church was accumulating were getting pretty hard to balance. The visible hypocrisy of the Church even led to the rise of the heresy movement. Russia generally skipped the whole witch hunt craze that was getting super trendy right about that time. But this period is the only one when Russia did have massive burnings at the stake 
those of heretics. We actually have no idea what were the teachings that they spread besides the denial of the Holy Trinity and some other Christian dogmas. Whatever made their movement so attractive to so many people was thoroughly destroyed by the church. There's even a chance that Ivan III was fond of some of their ideas himself. After a number of compromises and back and forths with the church, Ivan resolved to a safe method of rounding up all the priests that were spreading teachings unfavorable to the monarchy and its secular power and sending them off to prison or into exile. Problem solved. Finally, what made Ivan a truly full package was his wife, Sofia Paleolog, or Paleologina. I'm not sure of the proper English naming here, so I'm gonna stick to Paleolog as she's known in Russian historiography. She was quite a character. The family name might sound familiar because she was a member of the last ruling dynasty of Byzantine Empire and a niece of the last emperor. After the fall of Constantinople and the East Roman Empire in 1453, she ended up in the care of the Pope. Following the early death of Ivan's first wife, the Pope had a brilliant idea of marrying her off to the Moscow ruler and using her as a bridge of Catholic influence on him and on the region. But Sophia had other plans. She actually turned out to be quite invested in the success of her new family and homeland, and was happy to return to the Orthodox faith. A lot points to her actually being the one behind many of Ivan's good ideas, like stopping the tribute payments and standing up to the horde, or new administrative and financial institutions that really resembled those of Byzantine and Rome, and even the symbol of the empire to be, the two-headed eagle that is used Used on the Russian coat of arms to this very day was actually her family's, the Paleologue's, crest, which Ivan didn't really hesitate to borrow. It already appears for the first time on Ivan's seal in 1472, which is the same year he married Sophia. Ivan also leaned towards using Tsesar, Kaiser, or Tsar in his signature, with the letter adopted in fully official form by their son, Vasily III. Sophia herself apparently didn't get the memo of proper conduct for a female in Russia at the time. Instead of hiding in the women's quarters unseen and unknown, she was out there greeting European royals and proving to be quite useful at building Russia's image in the West. Her hand was also pretty heavy in building up the city landscape. She brought some of the best Italian architects to Moscow, beginning a long and cherished tradition of Italian influence on Russian art, architecture, and even military science. Novgorod, after all, was besieged with the help of a higher Italian military strategist. So, in the end of the day, I would support adding one more line to Ivan's already lengthy resume, being smart enough to listen to his wife. That is all for today. Stay home, eat through your pantry, get fat, stay safe, and I will hopefully see you in the next episode. That is if the world doesn't end.